Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. alaikum. Welcome to the newsroom. I'm your host, Ruma Khalid. But today is Friday, the 25th of August, 2023. The month of August is coming to an end, but every day brings in new stories, new developments, and that is what we are going here to discuss with you during the course of the show. We will begin with BRICS, ladies and gentlemen. BRICS, that is slowly and steadily coming up as a very strong contender for a global organization. Is it a champion of the developing world? or not. A lot of questions emanate, a lot of competitiveness with other international organizations uh, also emerges. Now, uh, the BRICS nations have also uh, you know, decided to extend this block. A lot of countries have become part of it, like uh, the King of Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the UAE. Other countries like Pakistan will be, inshallah, entering it next year. Uh, the fact remains that BRICS is slowly and slowly becoming a very strong, a big stronghold for countries across the world and its opinion is going to matter now and in the days to come. This is going to be our first story, the importance of BRICS in today's emerging world. Secondly, we will uh, dis be discussing uh, the uh, uh, Afghan situation vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. We all know uh, about uh, the re uh, issues that both the countries have, specifically when it concerns terrorism and the influx of organizations such as the TTP and the ISIK. Now, the Afghan interim foreign minister, Amir Muttaki, remember the one who had said in his first statement that uh, the Afghan soil will not be used against any neighbor, uh, neighboring country, met with a delegation of a Pakistani NGO. And here, uh, the, of course, he said that there was a need for a stronger uh, collaboration and a stronger dialogue between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Is this the need of the day? Will, is Afghanistan slowly realizing the importance of Pakistan and the importance of forging a closer, stronger relationship with Pakistan and understanding Pakistan's perspective on different issues, including terrorism? This is going to be our second story. And our third story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns uh, U.S. President Donald Trump. Now, former U.S. President Donald Trump has surrendered himself to authorities in the state of Georgia. He faces criminal charges that are related to efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Uh, will he stay in prison or will he uh, have some kind of an incarceration in uh, the future or in the coming days as well? We all know that the elections are also uh, coming in the United States of America. Uh, will uh, the popularity of Donald Trump continue to remain or will it wane? This is going to be our third story. Let's begin with our first and that concerns BRICS and the importance of this international organization in this developing geopolitical and geostrategic arena. More in the following report. The 15th BRICS summit is being held in Johannesburg, South Africa, marking the first in-person summit of BRICS nations since the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. The theme of this summit is BRICS and Africa, partnership for mutually accelerated growth, sustainable development and inclusive multilateralism. The BRICS block of top emerging economies has taken a major step in expanding its reach and influence with the announcement that six more nations have been invited to join as new members. Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates have been invited to join as full members from January the 1st next year. The bloc, which was formed in 2009 with Brazil, Russia, India and China, first expanded to admit South Africa in 2010. Before the start of its annual summit in South Africa this week, more than 40 countries had expressed interest in joining BRICS and 23 formally applied to join. Chinese President Xi Jinping called for an expansion of the BRICS grouping of emerging economies to build a more just and equitable international order, insisting hegemonism is not in China's DNA. This summit is not only the largest in scale since the establishment of the BRICS cooperation mechanism, but also the largest gathering of its kind in the global south in recent years. To discuss more on that issue, we've been uh, joined by Dr. Farah Nas, she's a foreign affairs expert. Uh, Dr. Farah, thank you very much to have joined us. Dr. Farah, uh, when you look at uh, the BRICS, the importance, the way countries are uh, showing interest to uh, include themselves in this important forum and how important countries are becoming members slowly and steadily of this important forum. Do you feel that uh, there is a desire by a lot of the, those countries that are part of BRICS to uh, play a level uh, playing field, which they consider has been rigged against them. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, we have to see why this desire is coming from uh, so many states. Initially, 23 states applied to be a member of BRICS. And in the first phase of BRICS, six members have been added on. That makes 11 in total. So um, if you overall look at the uh, population 
of BRICS at the moment, with inclusion of all these new members, it, it accounts for 46% of the world population. And if we look into the more economic stand, terms, it accounts for 36% of the world GDP. So it's very strong. Almost half of the world population is already there. And um, with the inclusion of many more other states in the future, what would be the size of BRICS in the future? I think this is going to be a deciding factor for the world politics and geopolitics to consider what is happening in the world today, particularly in the global politics and why it is happening. Uh, well, throughout like this phase of you know the inclusion of new members, well, it was not something unknown. Of course, we were all aware of that there were number of states queued up to, to join BRICS one way or the other, and successfully six members were able to join that. Um, why this, this is happening and why at this stage, I think this is something very impo important to me as a researcher of international affairs and international relations. Uh, to me, I think the major, uh, there are two major factors. One is um, the um, Russia-Ukraine war. And with Russia-Ukraine war, what happens is all the, the, the states in the world, they got concerned about what can happen to them by the hands of the global north. And global north, I mean to say G7 and G20, uh, where they they have seen the way uh, the, the, the their um, assets, the Russian assets, have been frozen um, in, in, in the banks of the Western countries. And it's not only Russia, but also Afghanistan as well, which was a teaser for the West to test how the world is going to respond back to it. Um, then again, it takes me back to, is it the first time that they are freezing assets or putting economic sanctions against the states? Iran has been under sanction for several decades. But what happened? Nothing has happened so far to Iran. So they continued their legacy and they turned economic warfare as a new tool of war. And making economic warfare as a new tool of war, they encouraged, you know, all their member states like G7 and G20 states to put sanctions on having trade partnership with Russia, having, you know, some sort of economic relationship with Russia and ultimately led towards de-dollarization. So de-dollarization is the second major factor in my understanding that led towards the inclusion and, you know, curiosity or a desire of so many states to join BRICS. Now, at this stage, uh, Dr. Farah, Dr. Farah, I'd like to cut you short here because you talked about a very important thing and that is de-dollarization. Can BRICS, in your point of view, dethrone the US dollar and do you feel this block is contributing towards currency diversification? Exactly. This block is leading towards currency diversification where it is challenging the existing status quo of the uh, global north at the moment where they are introducing, they have already introduced, in fact, their own contingent resource arrange, arrangement in comparison to IMF program, which is commonly known as CRA. And they have also introduced their new bank, which, which is called New Development Bank, which, which goes in contrast to the World Bank. They, are, they have also introduced their own currency, where they no more require dollars to trade in with one another. And they are also leading towards, you know, new mechanism for themselves. The financial system is getting reshaped. It's a direct threat to the existing international financial system and the global north in particular. So the global north is challenged by the BRICS and in the future, like when many more states, as I mentioned already in my talk in the beginning, that it accounts at the moment for 46% of the world population and 36% of the world GDP. So when many other states who are queued up at the moment, when they join BRICS, it will account for much more in terms of the population and in much more in terms of the GDP. So, of course, it is challenging the whatever is there with the Global North and the Global North has to think about their own policies. They have to think about how they are treating the Global South because the Global South in my understanding, is challenging the global north at the moment. And you probably will, will be aware of in the recent talks when uh, President Xi made a statement and he said that BRICS is not an institution that is going to, uh, uh, to challenge or uh, that is going to um, ask the, the member states to choose one side or the other. In fact, BRICS stands for peace and development, a very solid signal that President Xi has given that we aim for bringing peace and development in the world. We are not aiming for dividing the states and ruling them according to our own desires and needs. So 
the global north has to understand what is happening and why it is happening it's really important for them to, to take into consideration dr farah when you say that the global north needs to understand what the global south is going through and how uh, there a lot of countries joining the brics can pause uh, when it get, can lead to some serious competition between the global north and the global south i'd like to refer you uh, to uh, what werner hoyer the head of the european investment bank said he warned the west that it is in danger of losing the confidence of the global south unless it urgently intensifies its own support efforts for the poorer countries will the west make a course correction in this regard yeah i i think um this is a very serious um scenario for the global north at this time where we can see like in the past since like i've been growing up and at this stage even i've never seen some strong statements coming from african countries and recently very strong statements have been coming up from the african leadership who are calling on the face of nato that we are not your slaves anymore and do not treat us as beggars we are somebody who are having lots of natural resources and you are utilizing our natural resources for your own ends so these kind of you know i can feel that they are getting confidence the poorer countries who have always been violated used and misused by the glob global north they are getting together and standing for their right and they says we are no more there to to serve anyone for their interests we will do for our own benefits and when i was going through the number of states who have already joined brics two of them are still african states and those african states and with time i believe many more will join as well they will be able to stand for their own development to stand for their own peace and prosperity but here umar I seriously doubt that the global north will not let it happen that smoothly. Of course, it's a war, and we have to understand whenever there are two parties involved, when one party is leading towards weapon weaponization and they are establishing and setting uh, and acquiring new technologies, what happens is the second party also go for acquiring the same technology or better than that technology because they are in competition with one another. So same is the case with the BRICS, the global north, and the global south. They are in Farah, competition. Dr. Farah, Dr. Farah, Dr. Farah, there is a, a little bit of an issue as far as your image is concerned. There is a lot of lagging uh, in in your image. If we are trying to reconnect with you, so that this uh, lag can discontinue. In the meantime, let's talk about BRICS. Let's talk about the delegates uh, from the world's major emerging economies and dozens of leaders from across the developing world who have met in Johannesburg for the 15th BRICS summit. It began on the 22nd. It has ended uh, today. Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United. the arab emirates have been all invited to join as full members from the 1st of january next year uh, the kingdom of saudi arabia and, and iran are among the six countries who have been invited to join brics as new members next year more than 40 countries have expressed interest in joining brics 23 formally applied to uh, join the club which already represents a quarter of the global economy and 40% of the world's population dr faranaz welcome back to our conversation uh, we were talking about uh, of course uh, how uh, uh, the global north needs to understand the issues of the global south before uh, the global south completely uh, diversifies from uh, the global north through institutions such as brics i'd like to also understand uh you you said president uh, the Ch uh, chinese pre pre president xi uh, said that uh, this was a forum for peace we saw the uh, uh, the chinese and the indian uh, heads of state uh, together and discussing uh, uh, issues and this was more or less in a cordial atmosphere so that kind of reaffirms what you just said as far as president xi jinping had said secondly we are now see the kingdom of saudi arabia and the united arab emirates entering the fold of brics this is very important in my point of view are they drifting away from the united states orbit are they uh, trying to become global heavyweights in their own right is brics going to create a new world order oh uh, well it would be very uh, difficult to say that new world order is not getting shaped up yes they we, we were having a unilateral world which is no more a unilateral at this stage where we can see 
um, China as is as emerged and is one of the you know best economies in the world. It is second after America. No one can deny that. Um, Russia was was tried, you know, to by the United States to get affected through the Russia-Ukraine war, but instead of its economy or its uh, financial system getting getting affected negatively, it got strengthened. So instead of getting weaker, it got more strengthened in terms of its ruble getting more uh, strength and in position. So uh, through big bricks, I would like to refer to the same talk that President Xi delivered. Um, recently, and he said, we are not creating and setting blocks. We just want to have peace and development. So they are not aiming for setting blocks, but to me, I think there are already blocks developed. And in the, in these blocks, we could see the global north and the global south, they are standing in comparison or in competition to one another. And the competition is quite intense, where they are kind of, you know, the global south is kind of developing new financial mechanism through which they can bring together economies of the world and pursue a common agenda. And while pursuing the common agenda, of course, they have to work together with, with each other. But here is a little twist in, in, in the entire debate that BRICS is not based on voting system where they have to agree or disagree or something like that. It's based on consensus. It's based on mutual understanding. So when it comes to consensus, all concerned and partner states, they have to consent on a particular issue and then go about it. I'm a little fearful of the fact that India is somehow, somehow a misfit in BRICS. But will India quit BRICS or will India leave it? I, say, I think no. India will play the role of a spoiler in BRICS and it will try, since it is based on consensus, it will try to bring the decisions of the BRICS to somewhat towards, you know, a, a position where they are unable to take solid decisions. So India will continue to remain there and they, India will play the, the spy of the global um, north over there and spoil the decisions of the global north which is going to happen under BRICS. So it's a very competitive environment. How powerful countries, where China is one of the major powerful countries in BRICS, how China is going to react to it and how China is going to deal with it, time will tell. How do you see the success uh, of BRICS so far? Uh, this uh, year was 15th summit of the BRICS. In these 15 years, how has BRICS developed in your point of view? Well, we have seen it. I think you, your question answers within the question that um, BRICS started with a small kind of setup, which was brick in the beginning, and uh, slowly and steadily South, Amer South Africa joined it, and then it led to a further extension of, you know, Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Iran and UAE. All these countries also uh, shared their interest of joining BRICS, and we could see there's a huge line of countries who want to join BRICS. And here uh, we have to see why countries are so desperate enough that they want to join BRICS. Because they are really tired of the existing status quo. They are tired of the existing monopoly. They are tired of the existing weaponization of an, an, an economic warfare of the global north. Because the global north has, has adopted certain policies that are not directly um, in what's called like, you know, in, in, in constant relationship to the global south. So the global south feels frustrated. They feel abandoned. They feel that nobody care about them in the global politics. So they want to go and have their own system and their own arrangement where, where other states can look after their, their problems. And here the major thing is de-dollarization, as I mentioned earlier as well. De-dollarization, when America started de-dollarization as a weapon, because America can print as many dollars it, as it wished for. But the problem is how the other states are going to cope up with the, with the rising prices. And today, when we look at Pakistan and the dollar and all, how are we going to deal with it? It's not only the story of Pakistan. Many other states are struggling with this. So how the global south is going to deal with it? They need to have a parallel or, a, or an alternative mechanism to deal with the existing global system. And BRICS is something that is offering them the same uh, services. 
Uh, Dr. Farah, we did talk a little bit before in our conversation about the uh, uh, world order and how the BRICS could change it. Now, I'd like to refer to an article in the American magazine, The Nation, that was published on the 17th of this month that claims that the expansion of the BRICS agenda indicates a, quote unquote, a hunger for countering the serious shortcomings of the US-led global order. What, in your point of view, Dr. Farah, are the shortcomings of the current world order which uh, a forum like BRICS can address effectively? Well, I think um, at this stage where BRICS is, is, is expanding like a wildfire, uh, the global north, particularly America, being, you know, the, the, the hegemon of uh, the global politics at this stage today, it has to see how its policies can be revisited, which can lead towards changes into the existing system. So the expansion, it well, of course, it cannot stop the expansion of BRICS, and it cannot uh, stop, you know, uh, providing alternative means to uh, the global south and the uh, and the poor countries. But of course, one way or the other, as as I said, it's a competition at this stage. Uh, one way or the other, the glo global north has to come up with various mechanisms, various means, various measures through which it can tell the global south that, okay, if you have this ways of dealing with the problems, we can provide you alternate means or we can bring certain flexibility. And Umar, they also have to see their attitudes, the way they deal with the poorer or developing face. They have to look about or change their attitude towards the poor or the developing countries. Because if they put lots of pressure on the developing world, they are not going to achieve larger objectives of goals that they want to have. And we also have to see that it's not only the, the poor countries that needs the Western countries to come and help and support them, but the Western countries, particularly America, also need these countries, like the ones in Africa and the ones in South Asia. They need these countries for their own geostrategic and geopolitical ends. So they have to see what they want. They have to see what they want to achieve from all these developing states and how they want to deal with that. If All they right. come up with a different policy and they and they revisit their existing policy only, then there could be a solution to the problem. Otherwise, BRICS will keep expanding and it will take over the existing order. All right. Thank you so very much, Dr. Farnas. You have highlighted so many important aspects around BRICS, around uh, the, the global north versus global uh, south, and how the Western media is also you know, highlighting certain uh, uh, negative uh, uh, factors concerning BRICS, which of course maybe also leads to the fact that uh, the global north is quite concerned about an, uh, an organization like BRICS developing and strengthening with every passing year. Thank you very much, Dr. Farhan to have joined us. Let's come to our second story, ladies and gentlemen, and that concerns Pakistan-Afghanistan relations. We remember uh, the Afghan Interim Foreign Minister, uh, uh, Amir Muttaki, who in the very beginning, in fact, in the first statement after uh, taking the charge of uh, the Interim Foreign Minister, had said that the Afghan soil will not be used against any neighboring country, that includes Pakistan. Now, what happened afterwards, what ensued was quite the opposite. Now, a delegation of the Institute of Strategic Studies has met with Mr. Muttaki, and uh, he has uh, stressed the need for strengthening the Pak-Afghan dialogue, particularly on issues of mutual concern. More in the following report. Pakistan is desirous of a peaceful, prosperous, stable and connected Afghanistan and reiterates its commitment to pursue continuous and practical engagement with the interim Afghan government. Islamabad has been stressing the need for addressing security concerns, strengthening efforts for a robust economic partnership and promoting the agenda of regional connectivity and economic integration. In a welcome development, acting Afghan Foreign Minister Amir Muttaki has stressed the need for strengthening the Pakistan-Afghanistan dialogue dialogue, particularly on issues of mutual concern. Acting Afghan Foreign Minister met with a delegation of the Institute of Strategic Studies Islamabad, which visited Afghanistan, and Muttaki highlighted the notable progress registered in bilateral trade and spoke about the need for increasing focus on regional trade and connectivity. It was deliberated that both countries grapple with transnational terrorism, which warrants mutual cooperation and a collective response to eliminate terror threat. In a recent report, the UN Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee classified South Asia as a high threat region with several states suffering attacks. According to Pakistan Institute for Conflict and Security Studies, Pakistan saw a staggering 79% increase in militant attacks during the first half of 2023 compared with the corresponding period last year. The Afghan Taliban government has to honor its international commitments and prevent use of Afghan soil for transnational terror activities. 
Now, before we go to our guest, let me reiterate what happened. The acting Afghan Foreign Minister Amir Muttaki met with the delegation of the think tank, the, uh, the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, uh, who visited uh, Afghanistan from the 21st to the 23rd of this month. Uh, they were led by the ISSI Director General Ambassador Suhail Mahmood. They visited uh, Afghanistan on the invitation of the Center for Strategic Studies in uh, Kabul. Now, during this meeting, Mr. Muttaki highlighted the noble uh, and notable progress that was registered in the bilateral trade and spoke about the need of increasing focus on regional trade and connectivity. The acting Afghan foreign minister also stressed the need for strengthening Pakistan-Afghanistan dialogue, particularly in issues of mutual concern. Now, the, the, there was a statement that was issued after this meeting, which also said that Mr. Muttaki apprised the delegation of the progress achieved under the interim Afghan government on improving security and economy, controlling poppy cultivation, and addressing uh, corruption. The very important issues for a country like Afghanistan. Uh, uh, to discuss more on that, we've been joined by Brigadier Retired Said Nazir. He's a senior analyst. Sir, thank you very much to have joined us. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, with the key developments in post-August 2021 Afghanistan. What do you feel? How has the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan developed since the Afghan interim government took over? Thank you. Indeed, this is a very important question, and especially uh, the concerns and the Pakistan expectation, rather the regional expectation, which was attached uh, to the Taliban, Afghan Taliban, and their uh, uh, government when they came into power in August, 1, August 15. After that, the first thing which we received, rather the, the perception which was uh, led, that uh, probably Afghanistan will become peaceful and then there was, uh, the fruits and the dividends of uh, peace will be shared with Pakistan. Our uh, uh, western border will become calm and uh, it will be a mutual cooperation and there will be a lot of trust uh, and more so the trade will nourish as well as the people-to-people -people contact. And the refugees is also will return and so goes too many things were expected. But unfortunately, uh, we received the uh, increased wave of violence. It was about 56% in the first year of the, in, uh, the interim uh, Amarathim Islami in Afghanistan. And uh, now this year, about uh, seven months uh, uh, gone, and this uh, it has gone to 80%. And uh, these uh, violence attacks have become more deadly and specially targeting uh, the security personnel as well as uh, uh, other civilians. And uh, many times uh, this concern has been conveyed to the uh, Amarati Islami, uh, that is to the diplomatic channel as well as the special representative, and more so uh, many delegates uh, have gone there. Uh, but uh, somehow or the other, the state of violence has not reduced and it is not receding. And the question is that uh, the interim Afghan government uh, sees it that it is the Pakistan issue. But actually, the Doha agreement has uh, restrained them uh, not to, to allow their soil to be used against any, any other country. But unfortunately, their, their soil is being used against uh, uh, Pakistan. And so many uh, evidence so that maybe the, uh, the pictorial or that maybe the uh, communication or that maybe the Afghan national involved, that has been given. But somehow or the other, the uh, interim Afghan government has not responded in a positive way. There is one positive development, uh, and that is in the last uh, two, three weeks, uh, the decree which has come from Hebatullah uh, Akun, and that is regarding the uh, uh, decreed, uh, the, the, the jihad, uh, that it is finished, and more so they say that uh, fighting against Pakistan is not a jihad, but it is a war. And if it is a war, they consider it to be haram. And once it is haram, so naturally that uh, ideologue which was existing between the uh, TTP as well as the uh, Amarath Islami Taliban, uh, that has ended uh, uh, specially on the account of this decree. But at the same time, uh, tangible measures and tangible steps which are supposed to be taken to restrain all those outfits which are operating against the neighboring countries, uh, that is the practical step to be taken. And more so, uh, I must say that uh, uh, the Afghan government, since uh, it is an interim government, but still uh, two years is al almost completed, rather more than that. And in that they should come from the bayonet and weapon uh, to the type of government and governance, and especially the relations with the neighbors. 
So that is the transition which is a must for the uh, Afghan government to exercise. And they must uh, give it a heave because uh, all the diplomats, and especially the Pakistan, especially which is facilitating the Afghan government to be recognized. So some mm. of the steps to, uh, that is to be taken. More so, uh, this delegation which has gone from the uh, Institute of Strategic Studies, uh, they have also put those things in front, uh, that uh, the human rights as well as the girls' education, and more so uh, restraining such groups and border management and trade. So, so many things have been discussed with their uh, acting uh, foreign minister as well. Uh, but hope so that these delegations uh, uh, continue when they go there because with the people-to-people -people context and more so, more so at the diplomatic, at the political, as they say, the institutional, academic, and uh, all fronts, so they are supposed to be kept engaged uh, because the, the, the Afghanistan is our neighbor and we want that our uh, western border should become uh, calm uh, because the peace is uh, a must for the connectivity, for the trade, for the progress, and for the education as well as the health, uh, which is the dire need of Afghanistan government as well. And they are so much dependent on Pakistan on that aspect. So I suppose... All right, all right. I'd like to understand, uh, uh, Brigadier Said Nazir, you talk about peace. Of course, Pakistan is de desirous of peace. Looking at uh, all the havoc that has been done because of elements that have entered into Pakistan territories from the Afghan border. Now, the decree of the supreme leader of Afghanistan ruling Taliban, do you feel that is going to shape the security dynamics of the region? I suppose that is a positive step for the reason that they were not only comrade in arms, but they were the ideologue and they were having the allegiance to their spiritual leader. And once that allegiance has been bro broken and uh, decreed into the haram, so I suppose it's a big step because once understanding the uh, Taliban and especially their culture as well as their uh, religious ideology, uh, so on that account, I suppose it is a big step because previously the TTP were clinging to that particular pledge. Now that pledge has been removed, that umbrella has been removed, and now uh, if it is haram, so haram is supposed to be restricted. Haram is supposed to be changed, uh, chained, and haram is supposed to be uh, put in a bay that it is, uh, that is confined. So there are so many ways open for them to do that. And uh, I think uh, such sort of delegations which are going uh, and uh, must continue to go, uh, this will be uh, because the Afghanistan cannot remain in isolation. And isolation for some time they can sustain, but for longer period they cannot. And uh, I suppose another thing is that we must have a regional approach to this uh, because uh, uh, if TTP is Pakistan-centric, so uh, Daesh is uh, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, Pakistan, and all neighbor countries uh, uh, oriented uh, uh, in violence. Second thing is that uh, uh, Eastern Turkmenistan Islamic movement that is against China. So all the neighbors are in that way, uh, in that way uh, 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 affected. So naturally, uh, I support regional approaches also, but it should be dovetailed that if you want recognition, you want facilitation, you want trade, you want border uh, security arrangements, and more so the goodwill of the neighbors, I suppose that will be another, uh, you can say, uh, good step if uh, uh, Pakistan, through diplomatic channel, could uh, uh, realize this thing uh, and the regional conference is held and the message is conveyed. That is another aspect also, another best uh, which is supposed to be uh, explored. Uh, more so, I must say that uh, uh, probably they are realizing slowly, uh, but the thing is the change uh, in the uh, Amarat Islami mindset, uh, because previously uh, the way their government was and Osama bin Laden was there, uh, but he was, the, uh, he was the, the target or he was the enemy of uh, the West. But now the TTP is the enemy of Pakistan. And both are brethren country, both are neighbors, both are uh, bonded in many uh, ways. Uh, so uh, I suppose that doesn't suit that particular uh, analogy. Uh, they, they do not uh, uh, work with the, with, the, with the people who are uh, who giving them uh, a refuge or uh, right. staying there. 
All right, Brigadier Saab, I'd like to understand in May this year, uh, uh, the previous government's Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, uh, uh, the Foreign Minister of China, and Mr. Amir Muttaki met in Islamabad uh, for the fifth China Afghanistan Pakistan Foreign Minister's dialogue. Do you feel that through uh, uh, fora such as those, and uh, you also talked about the isolation that Afghanistan does not want to feel isolated, what does not want to be isolated. Do you feel the realization has come uh, to Afghanistan, uh, whether they say better late, late than never, that it needs to uh, work towards strengthening of its relations because there is this, the development cooperation between Afghanistan and other countries, then there is the possibility of Afghanistan joining the CPEC as well. Do you feel Afghanistan is thinking in those terms? I suppose that was a very good gesture, and especially the timings of that were very important because uh, the Chinese, as well as uh, they came from uh, uh, India, and uh, on the very second day, uh, their particular conference was uh, held, or uh, rather the meeting was held. And more so, it was a message because the day uh, the Modi government hijacked that particular conference, though our foreign minister, Belawal, replied, uh, and uh, I suppose in a proper way, uh, the, which was befitting. Uh, but at the same time, this particular meeting was uh, uh, good time, and more so, I suppose, China, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, especially uh, the connectivity which is concerned, or the terrorism issue which is concerned, or more so, the way or the route to the recognition is concerned, our engagement is concerned, uh, which is very vital. And uh, this, this particular aspect uh, is being recognized and being understood by the uh, Emirati Islami as well. And I suppose on that uh, way, some sort of uh, development is going on. Uh, and uh, if it comes true, but uh, the, the, the steps are slow. Uh, these are probably baby steps. Uh, so once the baby step will be converting into the long leaps, uh, I suppose the destination will be next. Uh, we should be hopeful uh, because we cannot afford to have uh, a bad relation or sort of acrimony or sort of uh, and uh, bad understanding with uh, our neighbors, especially Afghanistan, uh, because there are so many inimical forces uh, which are acting against the uh, relation between the two countries, and more so they want our western border to be hot uh, so that we could be concerned and our uh, especially connectivity and the CPEC is affected, our peace is affected, our progress is affected, our economy uh, remains uh, downgraded. So these are their missions, and they could be only achieved if they fuel the fire uh, with these uh, outfits which are uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, I suppose it should continue uh, with all the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tools which are available in our diplomatic city, uh, as well as with the people, intelligentsia, uh, as well as the religious cadre, and more so the people uh, in a traditional way. Because understanding Afghanistan is not only on the diplomatic front, uh, its history, its geography, its culture, and more so their ethos, uh, and the way they have remained as such uh, 40 years in war, 40 years uh, uh, almost destruction. So naturally, uh, their breathing space is required, and we are supposed to be a bit patient as well, but at the same time, very vibrant uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, very proactive as well. All right. Brigadier Saab, uh, uh, the U.S. Special Envoy on Afghanistan, Tom West, also met with Mr. Muttaki in July in Qatar. Do you feel that this shows uh, some kind of uh, uh, reliance or, you know, some kind of an opening of a new chapter between the West and Afghanistan that they want to continue some kind of uh, uh, dialogue or cooperation uh, between them and, uh, and Afghanistan? Do you feel there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel as far as that is concerned? Yes, of course, with America, they have not broken their ties because they have remained engaged in Doha for quite some time. And naturally, this uh, Doha agreement has come after a lot of uh, uh, parlays, a lot of uh, talks, and uh, so many facilitation uh, by Pakistan and, uh, uh, of course, the uh, uh, chaotic uh, exodus of uh, uh, the American forces. Uh, of understanding between the two countries are there. America has gone physically... But as far as their diplomatic presence or their intelligence presence or otherwise their uh, interlocutors, uh, they are there in the region. And more so, they are not leaving the region, uh, the Americans, because especially if they want to contain China uh, and they want to derail uh, 
uh, our restrict uh, CPEC to, to be expended. Uh, so naturally, uh, they uh, they will be prevailing and somehow or the other. But more so, their target was or rather whatsoever came into surface. Uh, that was to uh, to fight against the uh, Daesh. And Daesh, of course, there were uh, during Ghani time and uh, uh, as well as Karzai time, uh, the Americans were blamed for that. They probably they are providing with the arms and ammunition and plus the helicopter dropping and uh, 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 the, the, the uh, other support. Uh, but uh, if that is a many cent to be fought, so on the same account, we cannot uh, uh, draw difference between uh, TTP and Daesh and all such outfits because the war of, uh, against terrorism against all such outfits. So I suppose the cooperation, uh, if it comes, uh, so it should be uh, with Pakistan, it should be because the technical support which is required or otherwise the uh, the methodology which is required, how to do it. So that will be a common interest uh, uh, for the region, for the international community as well as Pakistan. Uh, I think the uh, uh, the Americans are having uh, some sort of relation and understanding uh, with Amarat Islami. Uh, and uh, that is their interest because it is the neighbor of uh, uh, of China course, is that, that is so true, Brigadier Saab, and a lot of historical perspective there as far as uh, Afghanistan is concerned. Let's hope that uh, the realization comes from the Afghan side uh, better late than never as far as what has been happening from the Afghan side, uh, especially when it concerns TTP, the ISIK and other such uh, outfits. And I hope some kind of a uh, uh, step in the right direction also comes from the Afghan end when it comes to that. That will lead to a lot of doors that will open for Afghanistan, a lot of development and who knows maybe the CPEC in the coming years if this trend continues. Let's come to our last story, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, Brigadier Said Nazi was talking a lot of uh, the cooperation between the US and Afghanistan. So my last story, of course, concerns the United States of America, but in a totally different uh, perspective. Former US President Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen, has surrendered himself to authorities in the state of Georgia. We all know that uh, he had been indicted as far as uh, his involvement in the Georgia 2020 elections are concerned and the criminal charges that he faces related to the efforts to overturn uh, these elections. Now, uh, uh, once uh, he uh, entered uh, uh, the area, he was booked a process that required Trump to have his mugshot taken, the first in U.S. presidential history. This is the first time that a U.S. former president uh, has uh, been uh, uh, pictured, you know, as part of the procedure of uh, being, uh, you know, uh, indicted. Uh, Trump quickly uh, did disappear into a motorcade after waiting outside. He has been released on a 200,000 US dollars bond agreement, the highest of all his, of his co-defendants. Uh, Trump uh, has apparently, as per the charges against him, uh, been meddling against uh, 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 the different kinds of elections. We, this is why he has been involved in this criminal charges in the, uh, for overturning the 2020 Georgia elections. But he says that uh, a lot of uh, these accusations that are being put on him are a, a part of a bid for him to be uh, not uh, become that important or prominent as far as the 2024 presidential elections are concerned. Will that happen eventually? Only time will tell. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's newsroom. Today is Friday, so of course, uh, weekend awaits all of us. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you, inshallah, Monday with new stories and segments that concern you, us, and Pakistan. Till then, Allah Hafiz.